I'm very happy to continue this uh, workshop today with a very interesting talk uh, that's coming up <clears throat> where Power on the Go is uh, particularly useful and uh, meaningful uh, with Aliaka from uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory from NASA, <clears throat> where also space applications are involved. Um, and of course, we all know that uh, in space applications, you cannot just go there and uh, push up your robot and then continue your mission uh, because it's basically um, you start the robot and then you hope you, everything is fine and uh, well working. So Aliaka is a, res a robotics uh, research technologist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, <clears throat> uh, where he's leading several projects focused on uh, robotic autonomy with uh, dual use, uh, and particularly focusing on Mars exploration, uh, but also again on terrestrial applications. And this is where it particularly becomes interesting for the Power On and Go system, and also reaches uh, terrestrial uh, applications and um, uh, use cases, so to speak. Dr. Akka leads uh, the team of CoStar and the development of the Nebula Autonomy Architecture, which won the DARPA Subterranean Challenge uh, in early uh, 2020, so this year. And uh, previously, he has uh, been with uh, Qualcomm Research. Uh, he was leading there the perception efforts for self flying drones, uh, but also for uh, self driving cars. <clears throat> and prior to that, he received a uh, postdoctor, of, uh, he, he was doing a postdoctoral research uh, at MIT. His current research efforts and uh, interests include um, artificial intelligence, autonomous decision making, uh, and per perception for a variety of different robotic systems, uh, which includes rovers, drones, and also light robots. <clears throat> he was uh, recently selected uh, as a NIAC uh, fellow. NIAC is the innovative uh, action basically of NASA's um, research uh, program in 2018. Um, and it's basically a very great pleasure to have uh, such a person here today in our workshop <clears throat> uh, where he will talk about resilient and consistent robotic autonomy in unknown environments with extreme conditions. So I guess without further ado, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you, Ali, here um, as a speaker. I see all your slides are set up and ready to go. So I will leave Thank you, thank you. So uh, can you confirm if you see the right screen or the one with the notes? Oh. Uh, we see, I think, the correct one. Uh, okay, looks like perfect. the correct title slide. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan, for the introduction, and thanks much uh, to all organizers for inviting me to this exciting workshop. Um, so the general topic of my talk is going to be on robotic autonomy, uh, with a specific focus on multi-robot exploration of unknown environments with extreme conditions. And some of the results I'm going to talk about are in the context of um, uh, DARPA subterranean challenge. Uh, so what do we mean by extreme conditions? Uh, this covers a wide range of situations, including the case where the robots need to traverse off-road unstructured terrains, uh, challenging perceptions when uh, we are dealing with no GPS conditions, um, variable illumination, obscurance, uh, maybe uh, this extreme conditions comes from operating in communication degraded environments, or uh, from resource constraints uh, uh, with uh, limited uh, compute capacity, limited energy, and so on. Um, handling these types of conditions uh, in general has a lot of potential to positively impact various sectors of uh, the, you know, industry and, and operations that robotics uh, systems can be very useful. Um, so I uh, specifically will talk a little bit about DARPA subterranean challenge um, as an, a good example that contains uh, several of these extreme conditions where Pogo is also a very important aspect uh, to, to its success. And in uh, part two of the talk, I will discuss um, some of the open problems uh, in, in handling these kind of extreme conditions and uh, discuss our autonomy solution called Nebula uh, and uh, some preliminary steps it's taking uh, in, in these directions to address some of, some of the challenges of, of uh, operating in extreme settings. So what is the uh, subterranean challenge? Uh, the objective is to autonomously explore fully unknown environments. Uh, and uh, DARPA, the sponsor, has picked underground environments. Uh, there are four competitions in the span of three years in man-made tunnels and mines, urban structures, uh, natural caves, and finally, uh, the, a mix of all these environments. Uh, 
uh, it definitely has uh, several aspects of these extreme environments, perceptual, uh, perception wise, it's uh, GPS denied environments, we have to handle obscurance, uh, dark environments, variable lighting, communication wise, it's very uh, challenging uh, as an underground environment uh, with no line of sight and uh, you know, multi-path environments. Traverse wise, mobility wise, it's also um, stressing uh, to the robotic systems uh, as we have to go through narrow passages as wide as like 80 centimeters, um, you know, uh, high slopes, stairs, and different types of terrains. Operationally, though, uh, this becomes even more uh, relevant to the theme of this uh, workshop, uh, where each team has just one hour uh, time slot to uh, complete the mission uh, and explore a multi-kilometer long maze underground with no prior map. And more importantly, no human uh, from our team uh, either you know, can enter before or during the competition into the course. We only see the course after the competition is finished. So the systems really need to be reliable. There's one external human supervisor that can talk to robots or receive information from them. But if and only uh, communication is established, which in itself, as we'll discuss, can be more difficult uh, than uh, autonomy problem. So many teams actually chose to just go with, uh, with full autonomy. Um, in terms of the scoring, uh, DARPA distributes 20 objects uh, in the environment and each team can get one point per object if our robots can get to that object, detect it, correctly classify it. Um, if we can localize it with less than five meter error, uh, which is an ambitious goal when you're dealing with perceptually degraded environment and multi-kilometer eight kilometer long course. And um, somehow within that one hour time frame, we need to communicate it back to surface either by coming back with robots or establishing some sort of communication link. In the last two competitions, uh, Tunnel and Urban, there were 14 teams from more than 50 institutions, a large variety of different robots and technologies. Uh, and our team, uh, like many other teams, uh, participated with a multi-robot solution, hence the name collaborative subterranean autonomous robots uh, or COSTAR. And it's a collaboration between JPL uh, with uh, MIT actually led by Luca Carlone, one of the speakers on this talk, uh, on this uh, workshop and with Caltech uh, where the Caltech team is led by Joel Burdick and Kaist from Korea and Lulia from Sweden uh, with our industry partners. So we still have uh, a lot of problems to solve, a lot of open problems in front of us in this challenge, but uh, so far the developed solutions uh, have helped us to win the last uh, round of the, the competition. And we are preparing for the next round, which has been delayed due to the COVID. In terms of solution and the concept of operation, uh, we rely on a heterogeneous team of robots with complementary capabilities from mobility and perception perspective. So we deploy communication nodes like breadcrumbs at the closer to the entrance of the uh, cave to create a wireless mesh network. Um, uh, but soon we have to, the robots have to leave the frontier of the communication range, be on their own fully autonomous, do their mission, and then come back to the frontiers of the communication range, tell us what they have found. And that's how the mission goes. Here you see, uh, uh, robots that we have been working on in the first two years of the competition, ranging from wheel to track to aerial systems to, to legged platforms to be able to handle various uh, challenges of this competition. So I have this uh, short video here to just give you a high level view of what the challenge is about some of the technologies we have deployed. But what you see here is the staging area, which is where actually our team only has 10 to 15 minutes or so. Uh, Technically speaking, 30 minutes, but a lot of it goes to the checklists uh, and so on. But this is the time to, to set up the system and let it go. So we have to be as close as possible to the Pogo situation. Uh, and as soon as the, the basically mission starts, people cannot touch the robots uh, and, and robots start moving. This is the view from that sole human supervisor. While we have communication, he can see the map being generated by the robots. Um, and in the right hand side, you see the, the mission progression he can uh, monitor. Robots start going into the course, exploring the environment, and the other robots start following to create a communication chain closer to the entrance of the cave. 
uh, while they can. As they explore the environment, they create a detailed 3D map of, of the course. Uh, and they do so in a multi-robot fashion. So you will see uh, these jumps in the map. These are the points that uh, you know, the robots come to rendezvous or the data comes to the base station. We merge the, the maps from different perspectives and align them and try to uh, you know, create a, a merged view. This is a two-level map created by our uh, legged platforms that go up and down stairs. This uh, robots need to handle perceptually degraded environment, dark, fog, smoke, and also traversability-wise, the environment is very extreme. So here you see footage from 900 feet underground at Arch Mine uh, in West Virginia, an active coal mine, where the robot is trying to create a mesh around uh, itself and uh, try to understand what is traversable, what is not, and if the part of terrain is not traversable, let's say for wheeled robots, it tries to inform the track systems, or if it sees you know, stairs, um, you know, the legged platforms, uh, are, are notified and uh, start handling that part of the course to be able to collectively, um, you know, cover, cover the space and look for artifacts. In the background, we have this concept called information roadmap. It's a, a graph that captures the connectivity of the free space and a lot of autonomy and information are encoded on this graph. Uh, it helps us to, uh, you know, enable behaviors like this where the robots go and one by one, uh, you know, cover and explore different rooms, different dents and passages in, in the environment to, be, to enable the coverage uh, requirements to, to look for artifacts. This is done in a multi-robot fashion. Um, so you see rendezvous points. This is one of my favorite moments. Two robots are talking. The third robot is doing its own mission, doesn't care. Find a very narrow passage between those two. We were really worried they're gonna collide, but it continues its mission and the other two you know, exchange information and then continue um, their, their own mission as well. Uh, so we need to be more intelligent that when the third one comes in the next rounds, they, they all talk to each other rather than ignoring um, the other one. In the background, we use um, simulation environments to VNV um, some of the efforts, so to make them more Pogo uh, ready or closer to that situation. And um, here you see uh, the feed from different cameras and in the right hand side, you see the um, machine learning, uh, you know, that is detecting anomalies, uh, certain artifacts or semantics of the environment. Those semantics are sent to the surface with the wireless mesh network that I mentioned, uh, you know, we create by dropping these communication nodes like breadcrumbs, but we can do so only close to entrance of the cave. So as soon as robots go a few hundred meters into the, uh, or several hundred meters into the cave, so we, we lose communication. So this is here you see a robot that we had lost for 30 minutes or so. It comes back to the communication range, dumps large amounts of data. We quickly, our supervisor tries to you know, retrieve, okay, what are the artifacts that the robot has found and all that sends them to the, the, um, the, the Docker server. Sometimes there's not enough time for robots to come back to surface. We have just one hour or they're stuck somewhere. Uh, so we use these, this concept called data mule. We send our, our aerial platforms to fly and go and somehow hopefully get close to the, the other robots, grab the data wirelessly and come back with a faster speed. So here you see in Beckley Mine in West Virginia, the drones are flying in, in um, GPS denied mines and looking for artifacts and also trying to get to the other um, systems to, to uh, play the data mule role. A challenge with drone, of course, is their operation time. So we have been working on this concept uh, called Rollercopter for the last couple of years. It's a system mainly designed to roll on the ground. That's the main purpose, but it can fly when needed. So this way we try to avoid carrying the robot drone weight all the time and, and you know, improve uh, the, the operation time. Um, in uh, here you see the Rollercopter uh, flight in one of the DARPA events. Bottom left shows how perceptually degraded the course is, the level of the dust that uh, come, uh, basically is created by, by airflow of the, of the robots in front of it. So I hope that gives you kind of um, a big picture of, of the challenge, the extreme conditions in this effort and the needs for Pogo and uh, some of the technologies we have been working on. So in part two, I will go a little bit deeper into our autonomy solution called Nebula. I will uh, discuss specifically some open problems uh, in front of us and uh, discuss our perspective or, or the direction we have picked 
to, to uh, go about these uh, problems and some preliminary steps there. So to enable consistent um, robot operations in real world, uh, you know, we need uh, resilience and robustness. That's one of the main enablers. So Nebula's approach to robustness is uh, to predict outcomes and uncertainty in, in, in future and control the risk levels uh, uh, by uh, tools, uh, borrowing tools and developing tools, algorithmic tools that uh, leverages integrated or co-design of inference and, and planning. So uh, this is more general than uh, just Docker sub training challenge. Uh, you know, we apply this framework to multiple, um, you know, projects. Uh, but um, pictorially, you can think of a traditional autonomy framework as a collection of these various modules, right? Planning, localization, health management, task allocation, and so on. And Nebula lives on the edges. It formulates and solves the joint problems between these, um, these blocks. As Stefan, the first speaker mentioned, you know, the, there are these gaps and we are trying to see if we can fill some of these gaps with, with some new theories uh, of, of, to handle the robustness. Slam Edge provides, a, I think, a concrete example to clarify the, this, this perspective. Um, so we know in robotics community, solving Slam leads to robust, accurate solutions, whereas solving localization and, plan, uh, and, and mapping separately and putting together those solutions uh, is not as robust uh, or, or accurate, right? So Nebula tries to push the same idea, similar ideas into other edges. So it formulates problems like SLAP, simultaneous localization and planning, or SMAP, mapping and planning, and tries to live in uh, these joint spaces. And uh, in general, uh, you know, uh, to the other edges uh, of, of, of this graph. Um, of course, this figure shows, you know, the, uh, the long-term vision. Some of these edges we have realized, some we are working on, but a lot of them we would like to see solutions from community, uh, that we learn from, we adapt and we adopt in our uh, framework and, and we are you know, working to, to cover this graph as much as we can. But that's kind of the, the vision and, and the perspective here. So uh, in the next few slides, I will um, go over uh, some open problems and challenges and uh, it's, you know, concrete examples of, of this uh, framework and, and we'll give you Nebula's uh, preliminary steps in, in addressing those. So as the first one, I'll uh, start with robust navigation um, in extreme conditions where um, we would like to enable uh, 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 you know, navigation in GPS denied environment, variable lighting, uh, obscurance, and so on. And the main question from Nebula perspective is, can we jointly model this problem uh, in, in the space of, as you see on the right top corner, state estimation, planning, and sensor health management to with the hope that we get help from planning to create more robustness on this estimation side. Um, so the, the, the environment is perceptually degraded enough that we have to you know, pick more than one sensor. So the nebula perspective is to quantify uncertainties and take actions that minimize the navigation uncertainty by uh, say in the first layer selecting uh, appropriate sensing modalities given the measurement uncertainties and also uh, fuse them in a way that minimizes covariances and uncertainties associated with the, the navigational performance. Example number two is uh, larger scale mapping. So we need to, the ultimate goal is to get to a few meters error over eight kilometer uh, course in perceptually degraded environments. This is an area we closely uh, collaborate with Luca, Professor Carlone, and uh, we uh, use uh, as the backbone of our frameworks graph slams, uh, graph slam uh, framework. But the nebula question there again is, can we take actions that helps uh, us uh, to share effic information efficiently and help the graph slam basically? Um, so as, as part of the solution to that, we try to carry our own nodes and you know drop ultra wideband nodes or things like that at the strategic points or come to the rendezvous points actively to, to enhance, uh, enhance the SLAM solution. Uh, these are concepts, again, beyond just what we have deployed at the sub challenge, but this is the, the vision and, and on the research part, the direction we are going along to, to deploy in the coming competitions. Um, the third uh, example uh, or uh, 
challenge in, in, in front of us is the communication when it comes to multi-robot systems, uh, where we need to exchange high volume uh, data and, and reason on, the, on those. Again, on the Nebula side, we try to look at this edge here that connects um, mission planning to communication and uh, we um, try to take actions that minimizes the uh, communication uncertainty by dropping nodes at certain strategic locations, dropping communication nodes uh, that creates high certainty and trust in ability to revisit them with other robots or they contribute maximally to the routing uh, system that we are trying to create so that the autonomous robot doesn't, robots don't have to come back all the way back to surface and uh, you know they just go less back and forth at the autonomous part of the mission to, so that we can cover uh, larger uh, grounds uh, in, in the competition. Um, as the fourth concrete uh, example and, and challenges ahead of us, um, uh, I, I would like to talk about the, um, the risk aware planning. Uh, so this is at the core of, of, of Nebula. Um, because the environments are really harsh and, and we really need to uh, move fast to be able to carry out the mission. So the question again is that how to control the pose uncertainty uh, and relative to the environment uncertainty so that it enables faster traversability. Um, so Nebula's perspective to this problem is again to forward project the motion uncertainty and quantify the risk. Um, so we, uh, you know, in the approximate Gaussian form, uh, Nebula aims at using, um, you know, sequential uh, um, composition of local controllers to steer the, the Gaussian distribution and the belief of the system so that we can control the risk that way and go through the, the risky and hazardous parts of the environment. And, but recently we have also been working on non-Gaussian um, predictions using deep learning and we embed them in MPC to control the non-Gaussian distributions. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about this uh, recent uh, line of work. Uh, we have a, a paper actually on this topic at this RSS titled uh, Deep Learning Tubes uh, for, for MPC, uh, but I believe this can potentially help uh, enable faster and robust traverse by uh, you know, forward projecting the uh, Gaussian distributions. Um, um, so we, we take this traversability information, put them in a framework called IRM, Information Roadmap, which is a graph uh, that captures the connectivity of the free space, along with other types of uncertainty from perception, like localizability of the system from communication. If that edge has a, has a node around it, a communication node, if it can, you know, communication can be done well on that edge. And we pass all this information to a, a PUMDP solver um, to, to tell us what is the next frontiers for the robots to, to, to go to. Um, finally, uh, as the last example, uh, multi-robot uh, coordination is a, a large open uh, problem uh, with a lot of challenges in front of us. And uh, the goal there is to come up with algorithm that, algorithms that dispatch heterogeneous capabilities to different parts of the course based on the mission specifications um, and based on the state of the mission uh, at that current, at that uh, time instance. And uh, again, uh, preserving uncertainty or uh, following uncertainty on this mission state, the robots uh, try to continue the mission, but when it passes a certain threshold, they try to come back to the communication range to seek for further information, uh, you know, if, if they can time the loss and if it's possible. So uh, this summarizes the, some of you know, concrete problems and, and open problems uh, in this uh, domain uh, in the context of a sub-T challenge um, and some of the preliminary steps we are taking in that direction. Uh, and in conclusion, um, uh, basically, uh, you know, many real world applications come with these extreme conditions. And you know, uh, Pogo capability and handling these uh, you know, uh, in, in this kind of extreme settings will have uh, high potentials uh, to uh, impact various sectors of, of uh, industry and, and everyday life in a, in a positive way. So our focus again was on, um, is on um, consistent operations in real world, um, you know, which calls for uh, resilience and robustness. And we do so, uh, we try to tackle that problem by looking at how we can predict uncertainty and risk uh, via algorithmic tools uh, and developing methods uh, to co-design inference and planning and then 
come up with computationally tractable methods to solve uh, planning under uncertainty in you know, MDP, pundp like uh, frameworks in continuous domain. With that, I would like to thank you. I'm uh, two minutes uh, past my time. Um, and this is a picture of our team member. Only maybe one third of our team is a large group of people behind these efforts. Um, here's our website and, and my email for, for future questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Very interesting talk. Very great insights and ideas, uh, particularly on the thought of Nebula, the whole connection basically towards these uh, elements that brings uh, forward a, a mobile system. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, here I'll pick the first one from uh, actually Valentin. Um, says, uh, also thanks for that talk. And uh, he asked for the basically uh, lowest hanging fruit for, for the algorithm. Um, well, the best implementation for resource constrained space hardware. What is the, uh, what are your thoughts on the algorithm, which might be the, the lowest, lowest hanging fruit for that? Um, for space hardware. Um, mm -hmm. um, interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, in general, I mean, space applications are very resource constrained and, uh, you know, the from from various angles energy the time but the biggest one for us autonomy people is compute um, so i think um, uh, the uh, algorithms that can um, you know um, be able to uh, kind of the distribute compute over over time and make it more sequential so that you can live in a, in a more limited capacity. I would say a more, um, uh, you know, um, more suited to space applications. In space, uh, you know, we have all these extreme conditions, but sometimes we can, we can wait at certain missions, right? So it's, um, it's very important if we can, uh, you know, transfer some of the algorithms that are computationally very expensive because a lot of things needs to happen at the same time uh, to, a, to a maybe more sequential fashion that we can fit it into very, um, uh, you know, bare minimum and, and less capable compute platforms uh, to, to enable them. And number two, I would say, is also co-design of, of them with, with hardware, right? The more we can, uh, you know, realize the algorithms or some aspects of it, some repetitive aspects of it in the hardware, um, then, you know, we will have higher levels of autonomy. Um, actually, Luca's work has been, you know, doing uh, Sertaj Karman's work. Um, a few works I'm familiar in the past few years have been looking at some of pushing some of the VIO and some of the um, works into hardware. Uh, one of the speakers earlier today uh, from real time uh, robotics company, we we're talking about these, but pushing the algorithms to the hardware level, I think will open more compute time uh, to enable, you know, I think um, higher levels of autonomy at the top level for, for space applications. Okay, thanks very much for this answer. Uh, I have a, out of personal curiosity, a, a question in particular towards the um, uh, aspect of uncertainty. So this uh, nebula aspect is very intriguing. Um, the, you talked about this um, basically reducing uh, uncertainty. Uh, my question starts actually before that. Uh, how do you make sure that your uncertainty is actually correct? And are you even concerned about that or are you just, um, trying to reduce that. I mean, uh, smaller concern, uncertainty is better, even though it's not correct, it's still smaller. Um, so how are your thoughts on that? No, that, that's a perfect question. And uh, kind of goes really back well, ties back well to some of the points Nathan was bringing up that are like unknown unknowns. Uh, yes, so we are, uh, we are pushing a lot on uh, known unknowns, which are the uncertainties we can model somehow. But then um, when it comes to unknown unknowns, we uh, have, Again, this is an open problem, of course, but our approach vision has been uh, maybe two aspects to it. One is we try to rely on consensus. That's where you see many of our solutions, we have various inputs. So we don't really, uh, so we usually we have two layers, maybe if you remember from my state estimation module. So we have a first layer that kind of looks at consensus and says, okay, you guys, I just don't rely on you. Thermal camera, you're, you're saying something that is very different. So that's, that's our main tool to reject unknown unknowns that just say you don't make sense. Then we, when we are limited to the 
known unknowns, then we go and you know, say, okay, we, we know these are reliable and we have some sort of models, now take actions. And that was kind of the second layer of the state estimation a cascaded model that I was showing there. Um, so that, that's one approach we handle on unknown unknowns. Number two is we push on, on learning. Uh, that's again a very younger uh, edge in the I would say nebula framework but that's again you know the, the talk at RSS is, is related to that, that that we try to adapt to the terrain you know we, we go and and as we see okay I'm keep I'm, I'm inconsistent with what I was thinking I, I should see I, I try to you know um, we, we try to adapt the models we try to you know post on dynamics and on, on uncertainties and so on but, but that's, of course, uh, uh, you know, we are at the very preliminary stages on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks very much for this insight. Uh, it's a very interesting topic also for us, of course. Um, so it's uh, great to see that you tackle that in that uh, rigorous. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank good. you very much. Um, I think uh, we are so far so good. Thank you very much. for.